All right. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us uh, today. Um, we will have a panel on considerations of substance in early modern English philosophy, uh, Codsworth, uh, Trotter, and Conway. Um, and our first speaker tonight will be uh, Natalia Strzok from uh, the uh, Universidad de Buenos Aires. Uh, Natalia, you have um, the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claudia. Well, I'm, I'm glad to be here again this year. I will share my screen. You can see it. Okay. Well, I will be talking about cat work this time. So I start. Ralph Cadworth was one of the main figures of the so-called Cambridge Platonism of 17th century. Although he is not a canonical author, there has been a panel on his philosophy in this year's seminar, uh, so he does not need further presentation. In his main work, The True Intellectual System of the Universe, Cadworth develops his particular dualism. After God, the two main substances are souls and matter. Yet Cadworth departs from Cartesian dualism of rex extensa and res cogitans, as the differentiation of the two substances is based only on activity and passivity. I quote, wherefore we conceive that the first heads of beings are rather to be expressed as resisting or antitypus, extension and life, it is internal energy and self-activity. And then again, that, that life or internal self-activity is to be subdivided into such as either acts with express consciousness and synesthesis or such as is without it, end of quote. The two substances are on one hand extension in the sense of resistance, hardness, and on the other hand, life or activity. This life can have or not consciousness. If it has, we are speaking about souls. If it has not, we are referring to plastic nature. It is interesting to highlight that this activity or life is internal to the only thing that it can be internal, matter. Cadwell's God, God is intellectual love and wisdom governing the harmonious world without violence. This is not a deity that interferes in every event of the world, what Cadwell intends to fight. This God sets its law which is translated into nature. In this sense, God represents the plastic nature, the perfect tool that God uses to govern harmony with wisdom and love. I quote, wherefore, since neither all things are produced fortuitously or by the unguided mechanism of matter, nor God himself may reasonably be thought to do all things immediately and miraculously, it may well be concluded that there is a plastic nature under him which, as an inferior and subordinate instrument, to dragonly execute that part of his providence which consists in the regular and orderly motion of matter. Yet so as that there is also, besides this, a higher providence to be acknowledged, which presiding over it to often supply the defects of it and sometimes overrule it for as much as this plastic nature cannot act electively nor with discretion, end of quote. This spiritual nature executes part of God's providence without discretion or election. It is God's blind instrument to govern matter. This last characteristic is explained in Cadworth's conception of the immaterial substance, stating that there is no need that it be conscious or mental in order to be active. This means that their configuration and motion of matter is due to the activity of the plastic nature which acts immediately on matter as an inward principle. 
This power is, I quote, a certain lower life than the animal, end of quote, which adds <clears throat> four ends to our good, yet without reason or consciousness, and I quote, which is either a lower faculty of some conscious soul or else an inferior kind of, kind of life or soul by itself, but essentially depending upon a higher intellect, end of quote. This means that plastic nature is not a particular soul, but a lower life that can be found in a soul. And it is the natural power that orders and moves matter. Souls are superior to plastic nature and act in a different way because the law that nature follows is directly God's law, although without any consciousness. <clears throat> that a leaf falls from a tree in autumn, and that all the trees turn brown and yellow might, might be caused by blasting nature, but that a dog barks depends on his soul. If the nails of that dog grow, it is due to that part of plastic nature in the dog's soul. It is a fine distinction, but yet of important consequences. It is the difference between regular and natural action and contingent actions of the soul. In summary, Cadworth's universe contemplates God, the intellectual principle of all, who prints his wisdom in nature that governs matter and yet occupies the lowest level in the scale of things, but before matter which is the last one in the scale as it has no life or self-activity at all. The highest level is that of the rational life, although obviously behind God's perfect intellectual mind. That means that God, human and animal souls, and plastic nature, are all active life in opposition to matter, which, has, which is absolutely passive and depends upon the active life in every aspect. The world is composed of both matter and immaterial substance because the spirit works inwardly in matter. This means that the extension is penetrated by, by immaterial substance. And if immaterial substance can act upon matter, they have to be connected in some way. In chapter five, Cadwell pretends presents again these two substances like this. I quote, there are therefore two kinds of substances in the universe. The first, corporeal, which are nothing but, but oncoid, bulk or tumor devoid of all self-active power. The second, incorporeal, which are oncoid dynamics, substantial power, vigor, and activities, which though they act upon bulk and extension, yet are themselves unbulky and devoid of quantity and dimensions. However, they have a certain bathos in them, in another sense, an essential profundity, end quote. It seems that, com that corporeal and incorporeal are opposite. And this is a problem for the working of one upon the other. But this immaterial substance, which acts inwardly in matter, in matter has a kind of profundity, bathos. This kind of profundity that Cadworth finds in Tiplicius is in Plotinus Enead 6, 8, 18 as well, where the philosopher presents the analogy of the circle in order to explain the relationship between the one and the intellect. This relationship is presented in terms of profundity, but Leroux affirms that this, uh, this is a pedagogical and heuristic tool that leads thought to the extreme and opens to contemplation. Kabur intends to explain that our intellection can achieve this thought of an essential profundity of incorporeal substance, acting in matter as an inward principle. In the notes to his edition, Moheim adds that the reference to Simplicius is due to the difficult to think or to understand this 
and relates that to St. Paul's bathos. Then the Cambridge professor presents some objections against the idea of immaterial substance, and the last one deals with what happens to the soul when it leaves the body. Capwell discusses with Plotinus, who, according to our author, sustains the possibility of a separated soul without any kind of body. This is nonsense, a paradoxical absurdity, says Capwell, because it is, I quote, dividing the life of the soul as it, it were into two, which is something, something that uh, the same Plotinus rejects in NL634. It is clear that for Cadwar there is an impossibility of finding the two substances separated in creation, or at least in material substance without matter. After profusely quoting Philoponus, Cadwar arrives to a conclusion about ancient incorporealists. I quote, they did not suppose human souls after death to be quite stripped stark naked from all body, but that the generality of souls had then a certain spiritus, vaporous or airy body accompanying them, though in different degrees of purity or impurity respectively to themselves. As also that they conceive this spiritus body or at least something of it, to hang about the soul also here in this life, before death, as its interior indument or vestment, which also then sticks to it when the other gross earthly part of the body is, by death, put off as an outer garment." End of quote. So there is not a naked soul after death, death there is an indument that is always with the soul. And we can think these different kind of bodies as an onion or a mamushka. There is a gross earthly body, which contains a spiritus body, where the soul is situated. We can conceive this as that profundity of the soul. These different kinds of body make a graduation from gross to subtle and spiritual. A physiological explanation is also given. And I quote, and indeed thus much cannot be denied, that our soul act not immediately only upon bones, flesh, brains, and other such like gross parts of the body, but first and chiefly upon the animal spirit as the immediate instrument of sense and fancy and that by whose vigors and activity the other heavy and unwieldy bulk of the body so nimbly moves, end of quote. Displayed the necessity of a mediation between the gross body and the immaterial soul, the animal spirits are those subtle bodies that connect the soul and the earthly body that allows perception. As instruments of the soul, they have activity that transmit to the heavy body. But this is not all. Reading some other platonic sources, Cadwell finds a third type of body, the lucid and ethereal one. In this way, the ancient philosophers suppose a terrestrial external body, an aerial and internal body, and this luciform body, even more internal than the previous one. He says afterward, I quote, this being as it were the vinculum of union between the soul and them, the aerial and terrestrial body. End of quote. There is a deep vital union that seems to use mediations and graduations. This accords with Christianity as well. I quote, which notwithstanding as this particular had the concurrent suffrage of the best philosophers, that the most genuine and perfect state of the human soul, which is, which in its own nature is immortal, is to continue forever, not without, but with a body. I leave here another quote. 
as a concord this catwork shows the agreement between ancient platonic philosophy and christian thought this said about the soul let us focus on plastic nature as I have already mentioned, it is the tool that God uses in order to impart her divine providence in creation. Kapoor explains as a general conception, I quote, that is, it is art itself acting immediately on the matter as an inward principle, end of quote. It, was, it works inwardly, following the divine law without consciousness, blindly and not in the mechanical way, but in a vital one. And he adds, I quote, wherefore the plastic nature acting neither by knowledge nor by animal fancy, neither electively nor hermetically, must be concluded to act fatally, magically, and sympathetically, end of quote. It acts fatally because it follows in a necessary way the divine law, without knowing the reasons. By magic and sympathy, Cadwell wants to distinguish this activity from the mechanical movement. There is sympathy among the creation between incorporeal and corporeal substances, a foundation for their work together, and it is magic because it cannot be explained in a rational way or in our way of acting or thinking. He adds, a quote, faith and the laws of commands of the deity concerning the mundane economy, they being really the same thing, ought not to be looked upon, neither as verbal things, nor as mere will and cogitation in the mind of God, but as an energetical and effectual principle constituted by the deity for the bringing of things decreed to pass." End quote. It is impossible to explain in a detailed manner, other than referring to faith, sympathy, or magic, how plastic nature works, because that will be knowing how God works. That will explain that this magical feature is the principle by which immaterial substance connects with material substance, a vital unity principle in the universe. The, the sympathy that we experience between our soul and our body, I quote, may be called also magical, end quote, because it is a vital action different from mechanical motion. The Cambridge professor affirms that even human souls have a plastic power by which the soul can form its own cogitations, which is not always conscious of as when we sleep. This means that plastic nature is present also in souls, in the plastic power of incorporeal substance. In summary, the created universe that Cadwell maintains is a union of immaterial and corporeal substance that work together in a fatal, magical, and sympathetic way. The important rule is that only activity can produce something, and a lower entity cannot produce a higher one. He says, I quote, Wherefore, there are being plainly a scale or ladder of entity. The order of things was unquestionably in way of descent from higher perfection downward to lower, it being as impossible for a greater perfection to reproduce from a lesser as for something to be caused by nothing. Neither are the steps or degrees of this ladder, either upward or downward, infinite. But as the foot bottom or lowest round thereof is a stupid and senseless matter devoid of all life and understanding. So is the head, top, and summity of it, a perfect omnipotent being, comprehending itself and all possibilities of things. A perfect understanding being is the beginning and head of the scale of entity from where whence things gradually descend downwards, lower and lower till they end in senseless matter. End of quote. The ladder seems to be all connected because the distance between its steps is finite, nor infinite. 
This allows us to understand everything by climbing this ladder through our knowledge. Although we have to use all our intelligence to understand this, as for example, this profundity concept of the immaterial substance, we participate in the divine intelligence so we can grasp this comprehension. And this ladder is finite because it has fixed streams, matter and the end and God above all. He says, I quote, Moreover, we perceive diverse degrees of perfection in the essence of things, and consequently a scale or ladder of perfections in nature, one above another, as a living and animate thing, above senseless and inanimate, of rational things above sensitive." End quote. This is something we perceive, and I think this is important because if the perception of a harmonious and orderly world that reflects an intelligent plan. And he adds, I quote, nor indeed could this gradual ascent be infinite or without end, but they must come at last to that which is absolutely perfect as set up of them all, end of quote. This state, this harmonious universe, how is it possible that there are wars and evil in the world? The answer is simple. Souls have a contingent activity. Thought can twist nature. In the last section of the true intellectual system, Kabura thinks that there is natural justice and says, I quote, wherefore the first obligation is not from will, but nature, end of quote. In opposition to some of his contemporaries, the Cambridge professor stated that if we conceive justice and political organization as artificial, selfishness prevails and community feeling is lost. He affirms, I quote, wherefore, conscience also is in itself not a private and partial, but a public and common nature. It is respecting divine laws, impartial justice and equity, equity. And the good of the whole when clashing with our own selfish good and private utility. This is the only thing that can naturally consociate mankind together, lay a foundation for bodies politic and take away that private will and judgment according to men's appetite and utility, which is inconsistent with the same, end quote. In order to achieve a peaceful state, human mind has to understand the connection that entails everything, the order that, go that govern the universe, the intellectual principle that create this perfect ladder of being. Thank you very much. I use... Thank you very much, Natalia. Did I um, use, uh, yes, 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 yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, we have a clear screen now. Okay. So uh, next, we will hear from Sofia um, Calvente uh, from the Universidad Nacional de la Plata, uh, who will be talking to us about Catherine Prather Cockburn. Uh, Sofia. Well, thank you very much, Claudia. Thank you for uh, uh, spelling correctly my <laughs> last name. Uh, well, I'm very pleased to be here for the first time and thank you to Natalia who helped me out and accompany me <laughs> in this panel. <laughs> so, well, I'm going to talk about Catherine Trotter uh, and the uh, paper name is uh, Catherine Trotter Cockburn's Puzzle, Immaterial and Intelligent Substance, Thinking Matter and a Hierarchy of Beings. Uh, I don't have a PowerPoint, so... Uh, <laughs> just a, a text. Catherine Trotter Cockburn develops a novel and disruptive connection, um, conception of substance that blurs any sharp distinctions between matter and spirit. This conception emerges in the definition of space she provides in Carcery Thoughts, a short metaphysical piece prefixed to her remarks upon some writers. In this text, Trotter considers space as a non-thinking immaterial being 
acting as a link between non-thinking material substance and thinking immaterial substance. In order to argue for this definition of space, she appeals to the well-known thesis that the universe is organized as a great chain of being. Emily Thomas has suggested that this novel conception of space already finds a pre uh, precedent in Trotter's first work, A Defense of, of Mr. Locke's Essay, where it is shown that the soul does not need to think to exist. Thus, the necessary link between thought and immateriality is dismantled, and the way to the subsequent definition of space as a type of immaterial and non-thinking substance is paved. However, Certain statements from a defense are difficult to reconcile with the thesis of the hierarchy of beings presented in remarks. Notably, in her early work, Trotter mentioned Locke's substantial agnosticism and takes up his suggestion that it is not impossible for God to have added thought to matter. The possibility of thinking matter is difficult to admit within the framework of the universe conceived as a hierarchy of beings because matter occupies the lowest place in it. Therefore, a puzzle arises within Trotter's metaphysics that threatens the, continu the continuity between her early and her mature work. I aim at reviewing the different aspects of this puzzle and analyzing the chance to find some way of conciliation between thinking matter and non-thinking immaterial substance within the same ontological frame. In particular, I will evaluate whether Ralph Cudworth's conception of immaterial substance as an active principle that works within matter is an alternative that will help solving the puzzle. I will show that Trotter's arguments reveal a methodological stance which shows that the modes of being far exceed our cognitive capacity. But this fact should not prevent us from considering if only the bare existence of these possibilities the great chain of being formulations. Trotter mentions the great chain of being thesis is beautifully described by Mr. Addison and Mr. Locke. This means that the contradiction between the hierarchy of beings and the possibility of thinking matter is a problem she inherits from Locke, who mentions both, both questions in an essay concerning human understanding. Although neither Locke nor Trotter perceive the contradiction, it leads to more serious consequences in Trotter's case, because she invokes the scale of beings in support of her novel conception of space, while it does not have a central role in Locke's philosophical arguments. Jacqueline Broad has pointed out that Trotter could, could have been influenced not only by Locke, but also by, by Cudworth, since the latter is quoted in the texts of Edmund Law and Isaac Watts that Trotter discusses in Carcery Thoughts even though she does not quote or allude to Cadworth straightforwardly. I will deal briefly with the statement of the grain chain of thesis in Locke, Cadworth, and Trotter, and then examine whether there is room in this scale of beings for thinking matter. Prior to that, let us recall that the great chain of being is a very ancient thesis that roughly states the universe is a hierarchically organized whole. This organization is structured around three principles. The first one is that of plenitude, which states that the universe emerged from a self-sufficient, self-transcendent first principle. The fertility of the first principle leads to the complete translation of all the ideal possibilities into actual beings. The second one is the principle of continuity, which states that there cannot be gaps between one class of beings and another. Lastly, the principle of hierarchy or gradation postulates that not all existing beings have the same metaphysical value. Thus, the universe is built as a hierarchically organized natural chain based on the degree of excellence or perfections or perfection of beings. Locke refers to this thesis by pointing out that, and I quote Locke, in all the visible corporeal world, we see no chasms or gaps. All quite down from the all quite down from us, the descent is by easy steps and a continued series of things that in each remove differ very little one from the other." End of quote. 
Based on this empirical statement, he considers that we, that we can plausibly argue this hierarchy continues upwards, and there are probably many more classes of immaterial beings above us than material species below. This means our place in the scale of beings is more distant from the divine nature than from the lowest grade of creatures. Cutworth makes use of the great chain thesis to argue against the possibility that thought can result from matter. He claims that the authors who maintain that thought is a property of matter are inverting the order of nature, which proceeds from the highest, the perfect omnipotent being, to the lowest, which is stupid and senseless matter, devoid of all life and understanding. Notice that Cutworth presents the hierarchy of being thesis from an ontological perspective, while Locke builds his argument from the epistemic point of view. The epistemic perspective tends to overlook the fact that the, things, uh, that the thinking matter suggestion represents an inversion on the ontological scale, since it is not possible that a higher being emerges from a lower one. Cathworth argues that the possibility of matter endowed with thought could only occur in a universe where there is no uh, natural gradation of beings, but only one flat level in which matter adopts several forms and modifications. How does Trotter state the great chain thesis in carcery thoughts? Following Locke, she adopts the epistemic perspective, presenting the scale of beings as an a posteriori argument, which is inferred via observation of the natural order and is, I quote, apparent through all the known works of God, end of quote. Thus, she describes the ontological gradation not as a descent from a first principle like Cadworth, but, but as an upward progress. In this context, Trotter argues about the role of space within the hierarchy of beings. And I, I quote uh, Trotter. There should be in nature some being to fill up the vast chasm betwixt body and spirit. Otherwise, the gradation would fail. The chain would seem to be broken. What a gap between senseless material and intelligent immaterial substance, unless there is some being which by partaking on the nature of both may serve as a link to unite them and make the transition less violent? And why may not space be such a being? Might we not venture to define it an immaterial and intelligent substance, the place of bodies and of spirits, having some of the properties of both? End of quote. Before stepping in the nature of space and its role in the ontological scale, I will consider how the contradiction inherited from Locke affects Trotter's argument. What are the consequences of detaching immateriality from thought for the chain of being? A material chain? When dealing with the question of the immortality of the soul in a defense, Trotter entertains the possibility that the soul may not be an immaterial substance whose main attribute is thought. The substantial agnosticism shared with Locke leads her to argue that it is not possible to determine whether thought is a substantial property of the soul or not. Trotter points out that we can conceive life without thought because life and thought are two different things. Insects and plants, for example, have life but do not think. If we hold that soul is a substance, then it has a permanent character. This means that its exercise is not subject to the uninterrupted practice of an activity such as thought. Uh, sorry, this means that its existence is not subject to the uninterrupted practice of an activity such as thought, as the case of deep sleep proves. If the soul lives on, uh, even when, when we do not think, then the power of thinking might not be the peculiar attribute that distinguishes soul from other substances. And nothing prevents us from considering that matter may have that attribute as well. Thus, Trotter comes to concede the possibility of thinking matter proposed by Locke. But this concession brings about the problem of finding a place for thinking matter within the hierarchy of things, if there could be any. From Cutworth's perspective, there would be no chance of finding such a place because matter could never give rise to a higher form of existence, such as thought, nor be the cause of an attribute that it does not possess. However, it is not that easy to rule out the possibility of thinking matter if we take into account the principle of plenitude. 
this principle states that the entire spectrum of possible things is exhaustively exemplified in the universe. Then an entity whose existence that does not imply a contradiction should indeed exist, because otherwise it would threaten divine omnipotence and freedom. Hence Locke in the famous passage where he introduces thinking matter claims, I quote Locke, I see no contradiction in it that the first eternal thinking being or omnipotent spirit should, if he pleases, give to certain systems of created senses matter, put together as he, he thinks fit, some degrees of sense, perception, and thought." End of quote. Locke is aware of the controversial character of his suggestion because it goes against the properties usually attributed to matter, extension, divisibility, passivity, and impenetrability. However, he argues that uh, we have empirical proofs of the existence of, existence of phenomena that we do not understand, such as mental effects of material movement, namely pleasure and pain. If in the same vein, we ought to admit the possibility that God may well add to matter the power of thinking. Both are logically possible phenomena, even though we do not understand how they occur. In short, although Locke's substantial agnosticism traces the limits of our understanding, it also leaves room for the infinite ontological possibilities arising from the divine omnipotence, possibilities that transcend our narrow cognitive capacity. In this framework, one of Trotter's arguments hints at a possible place for thinking matter in the great chain of being. By the end of a defense, she claims uh, we should not identify matter with body, because this entails that if the, soul, if the soul is material, then it cannot exist after the dissolution of the body. I quote uh, Trotter, but one who thinks God may have given perception and thought to some systems of matter disposed as he, as he thinks fit, may suppose this system distinct from the body and to continue in the same state of co cogitation when the body is dissolved, end of quote. Trotter just suggests then that different types of matter can exist, some of which may not only possess thought, but also be indivisible and therefore immortal. Trotter's suggestion does not end in the materialistic scenario outlined by Cagworth, which was made up of a single ontological level where matter adopted different forms and modalities. On the contrary, Trotter states that the soul is a distinct and permanent substance united to the body, which at death could depart from the body and continue to exist. While, while Cudworth regards matter as one of a kind and devoid of a life and understanding, in Trotter's perspective, thinking matter would be ontologically superior to, body, uh, to bodily matter, since it would be indivisible and immortal. This interpretation brings forth a material hierarchy of beings, since if we concede matter can bear all the properties that, that are attributed to to a spiritual substance, the latter becomes superfluous. However, it gives rise to a major difficulty which resides in its inconsistency with, with the hierarchy of beings Trotter states in her mature work, since as we, as we have seen, she explicitly mentions an intelligent immaterial substance which she relates to spirits. Trotter's official definition of the chain of beings would not be composed of different kinds of material substance, but would also include immaterial beings as well, space and soul within the great chain of being. The possibility of a material hierarchy of beings is ruled out in cursory thoughts, where Trotter defines space as a substance that links two other types of substance that are essentially different, the senseless matter and the intelligent immaterial the senseless material and the intelligent immaterial. This scenario poses a substantial pluralism rather than a monism, and at the same time bestows an undoubted, undoubtedly immaterial character to the soul and to spirits in general. Trotter introduces the definition of space as an immaterial and intelligent substance in the context of a discussion about its ontological nature, which, where she resolutely argues for a substantial stance. 
the discussion about space leads her uh, to the question, uh, leads her to question the classifications that reduce every existing being to two categories, spirits and matter. This reductionism blocks the possibility of thinking about the existence of many other ontological categories. Her statement of the scale of beings thesis is invoked precisely in support of this substantial pluralism in order to defend the conjecture that the universe is composed of a hierarchy of beings whose nature is not only and exclusively material or spiritual. Trotter defines space as the place of bodies and of spirits. This definition carries unusual consequences along, especially for the notion of spirit. There is nothing strange in considering space as the place of bodies, but it can be puzzling to suggest that it is also the place of spirits because it entails that spirits have extension. Does it mean Trotter is turning back to her hypothesis of the material, material soul? Not necessarily. Trotter points out that spirits can be extended, but not in the same manner as bodies are. Since we only have a partial knowledge of substance in general, it is possible to conceive some kind of extension consistent with the indivisibility, which we suppose essential to thinking, think, thinking substance. I quote, a simple uncompounded, therefore indivisible yet extended substance carries with it no contradiction, end of quote. However, if we remember that the notion of space rests on the statement of the no necessary connection between thought and immateriality, then the argument Trotter presents in cursory thoughts does not rule out the possibility of thinking matter. Furthermore, if we consider that in this text, she maintains at the same time as a substantial agnosticism, the scale of being thesis and the premise that divine omnipotence should not be limited, then by the principle of plenitude, we should admit that God may have given a thinking power to matter. But if we also take into account substantial pluralism and the principle of hierarchy, then it would be unlikely that God would have altered the gradation he established, endowing an ontologically inferior substance with an attribute that belongs to a higher one. The latter alternative would imply a violation of the natural order, which would amount to a miracle. Consequently, the principle of hierarchy seems to be a deciding factor to rule out the possibility of thinking matter. At this point, we can note that Thomas' suggestion of a connection between Trotter's earlier and mature metaphysical views is tenable if Trotter already has an immaterialist conception of the soul in mind in a defense and does not take the thinking matter hypothesis seriously. In cursory thoughts, she draws heavily on the premise that only if thought is not a necessary consequence of immaterial substance, we can conceive a non-thinking immaterial substance. However, in a defense, the materialist conception of the soul is not stated resolutely. Quite the contrary, it leads to the suggestion of its materiality. Given this situation, the dismantling of the necessary link between thought and immateriality outlines two opposite scenarios. In a defense, it leaves open the possibility for thinking matter or material soul, while in cursory thoughts, it gives room to non-thinking immaterial substance. Both alternatives could not exist simultaneously within the same scheme because in a defense it will result in a material hierarchy of beings while in cursory, cursory thoughts it, it produces a scale of ontologically different entities space and, na and plastic nature immaterial and intelligent beings is there a way to reconcile the opposite lines into which trotter's metaphysics splits would an alternative such as Cudworth's suggestion of an, of an immaterial substance which acts inside matter be helpful? While reviewing earlier the different statements of the great chain of being, we noticed that the possibility of thinking matter represents in Cudworth's eyes an inversion of the order of nature. One of the main arguments he uses against this possibility is that a superior kind of beings cannot be produced from an inferior one. Matter occupies the lowest rank in the scale of being, and therefore this, it is impossible that it can give rise to thought. Even though Cadworth explicitly mentioned the principle of plenitude when describing the perfect and omnipotent being as comprising in himself 
all possibilities of things, there is no way he would consider like Locke that there is no contradiction in supra-adding thought onto matter. This gesture would be a whim that would unnecessarily alter the legal structure of the universe, a regularity guaranteed by the action of plastic nature. Therefore, the chance of a material scale of beings is completely ruled out. Cutworth maintained that plastic nature is always united to matter and is a principle that moves and animates different beings, but he regards it as a different kind of substance that can in no case be explained in material terms, nor be reduced to material properties by any means. Cutworth defines black plastic nature as an active principle, which God employs as an instrument to impart his divine law and guarantee a harmonic order throughout the cosmos. Like Trotter's space, it is immaterial and devoid of all perception and consciousness. Hence, in both author authors, we know the same disconnection of immateriality and thought, which opens the possibility for the existence of, of an intelligent immaterial entities. Could space and plastic nature belong to the same type of beings? The similarities are limited to the fact that both are immaterial and unthinking beings. But then several important differences emerge. The main similarity between plastic nature and space is that the former is essentially active, while space, Trotter tells us, is just a place, it is inanimate. This implies that it does not organize or execute any type of design. She also says it is extended, a quality quad worth denies to plastic nature. On the other hand, plastic nature is a principle whose activity is exclusively restricted to matter. Therefore, it is impossible to find in the universe immaterial substance separated from matter. As a consequence, even the beings that occupy the highest place in the ontological scale are united to some type of matter. Trotter, for her part, regards defining a substance in terms of a principle of action as something at least troublesome. I quote, how is it possible to conceive that the actions of a being are the being itself? End of quote. An action or power cannot constitute a substance by itself because an action or power needs a subject to exert it. Quote, what idea can we frame of a power without supposing some being to which it belongs? Actions and abilities, and I, don't, I'm, I have no other idea of powers, seem unavoidably to imply some subject of them some being that exerts its powers in different ways of acting, end of quote. That subject and not the action it exerts is what, did, strictly speaking, ought to be considered as a substance. Although we can take observable properties or attributes as criteria for distinguishing one substance from another, it is not right to claim that a substance can be understood in terms of its attributes only because these attributes must have a subject of inhesion. And given this subject is a substance, it is endowed with a different and permanent character, which means that if it ceases to act, it will not cease to exist. In sum, although both plastic nature and space share certain features that could place them on the same step of the ontological scale, scale, the fact that they are immaterial and non-thinking beings, there is no room in Trotter's metaphysics for the existence of, of a principle such as plastic nature, which is defined in terms of it, its activity only and is regarded as, regarded as a substance which cannot exist apart from matter. This kind of being is inconsistent with her definition of substance as an agent and as a permanent independent being. Conclusion. The analysis of different aspects of Trotter's metaphysics highlighted divergent ontological tendencies which seem to have not suitable ways of reconciliation. These difficulties can be partly explained by the fact that Trotter does not intend to exhaustively develop a system of metaphysics, but rather her, her main philosophical interests revolve around moral questions. In general lines, her remarks concerning ontological issues are subservient to arguments related to the grounds of moral distinctions, rewards and punishments in the future life, or the immortality of the soul, to name a few. 
Despite the tensions that arise when studying the metaphysical passages of Trotter's work, there is a common methodological strategy underlying them, which consists in the search for alternatives to dogmatic positions. Following, following this strategy, Trotter considers the existence of thinking matter and unintelligent immaterial beings, proposes a substantial uh, pluralism and various types of extension, all of which aim at showing that not everything should be placed into rigid categories or fall within the limited spectrum of our cognitive capacity. There may be more ways of being than the ones we can conceive. These diverse ontological possibilities lead Strutter along paths that may, in an overall vision, be inconsistent with each other. But the important thing is not to bring these multiple alternatives uh, it, the important thing is to bring these multiple alternatives into focus, even though our understanding cannot tell which of them actually make up the fabric of the universe. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sophia. All right, so um, our last talk for uh, today is for, uh, from Olivia Branscombe from Columbia University, who will be talking to us about Conway. In the meantime, if you have um, questions, please write them in the chat or you know, just put Q in the chat so we can have the Q and A at the end. Okay, um, thank you to the organizers and to the other speakers. I'll just get right into it and hope that my slides work. Okay, this talk has two main objectives. First, I want to motivate and explain the view that Anne Conway is a panpsychist. Though Conway has occasionally been labeled a panpsychist in the literature, what exactly this label means still needs to be worked out, as do its implications for how we should understand other aspects of her metaphysics. Secondly, I want to argue that the theoretical virtues of Conway's panpsychism hang significantly on her ontology of the created world or her particular brand of monism about nature. For example, one purported advantage of panpsychism is the way it dispels the mind-body problem. It seems to avoid the emergence problems posed by physicalism while sidestepping the interaction worries to which dualism gives rise. I suggest, however, that panpsychism on its own doesn't really solve the mind-body problem or rather mind-body problems as they should properly be called. What's needed is panpsychism plus an accompanying ontology or at least a specification of what exactly the pan and panpsychism means. My goal is for this project to help expose what is required of panpsychism as a response to the mind-body problem, while also improving our understanding of the philosophy of Anne Conway. Okay, so I have my outline here. It's not very developed. Um, part one, Conway as panpsychist. It's uncontroversial to describe Conway as a vitalist, both because of her rejection of the possibility of quote, dead matter, and because of her intellectual and personal associations with the Helmontian vitalistic tradition. I suggest that her vitalism can also be interpreted as panpsychism. Panpsychism is, you know, kind, kind of a widely misunderstood, or at least it it's, can be characterized in various ways. Um, and it's important to get clear on what exactly I mean by it when I apply the term to Conway. So here I'm following William Seeger, who's a prominent contemporary theorist of panpsychism. And he puts the view this way, the world is awake, that can stand as a slogan for panpsychism. The view that I will understand here as holding that consciousness is fundamental and ubiquitous in nature. This does not mean that everything is conscious. Unlike Seeger, I'm not dealing with consciousness in the full sort of hard problem, what it's like sense, at least not at this stage of the project. Um, instead, I'm focusing here on establishing that mental capacities are fundamental and ubiquitous in nature. So I've modified Seeger's definition for Conway to read that mental capacities are fundamental to and ubiquitous in nature. Okay, so let's look briefly at Conway's vitalism to see how it might imply panpsychism. Conway supposes that everything in existence is animate and alive. She thinks this principally because of her views about the relationship between God and creation. She views God as essentially a creator and creation as resulting from an emanation or overflow of God's communicable attributes. Though I can't elaborate much on emanation in this talk, it's helpful to point out that only God possesses the communicable attributes perfectly. 
Everything else in creation displays those attributes in an imperfect or attenuated way. And Conway thinks that God's communicable attributes account for the positive content of all features of creation. So any feature that is apparently not shared with God, from mutability to finitude, even to occasional wickedness, this is not something that's sort of gotten from God in a sense. It simply reflects creaturely imperfection, which is necessary in her view in order to distinguish substantially, which is really important to her, between God and creatures. So Conway thinks God would not create some creature totally lacking in one of God's communicable attributes. And this is basically her argument for universal vitality. The first quote on the slide says, quote, for since God is infinitely good and communicates his goodness to all his creatures in infinite ways, so that there is no creature which does not receive something of his goodness, and since the goodness of God is a living goodness, which possesses life, knowledge, love, and power, how can any dead thing proceed from him or be created by him, such as mere body or matter? according to the hypothesis of those who affirm that matter cannot be changed into any degree of life or perception. And the second quote says, it has truly been said that God does not make death. It is equally true that he did not make any dead thing for how can a dead thing come from him who is infinite life and love? Close quote. For Conway then, vitalism means the view that everything in existence is animate and alive. While these passages certainly provide evidence for her vitalism in the sense just explained, I wanna point out another of their features. So the longer of those two passages up on the slide shows that although Conway is sort of here arguing for the universality of life in nature, she's also arguing for the ubiquity of knowledge and perception. And later in the same section of the text, she asks how any creature could be blessed by God or enjoy God's divine goodness, quote, without life or perception. Indeed, in many places throughout the principles, Conway's only extant text other than um, her correspondence, she lists life, knowledge, and perception together. And we see this all the way through chapter nine, where she distinguishes her view from the views of Descartes and Hobbes. She says, for they, Descartes and Hobbes, ignore the most noble attribute of that substance, which they call matter and body, and understand nothing about it. If anyone asks what are these more excellent attributes, I reply that they are the following, spirit or life and light, by which I mean the capacity for every kind of feeling, perception, or knowledge, close quote. So Conway associates life, perception, and knowledge. And in light of her commitment to universal vitality, we can already sort of see down the path of attributing panpsychism to Conway. But this is all a little too quick. Um, according to the definition that I set out at the beginning of the talk, there's a bit more work to do. So firstly, what counts as a mental capacity is a very good question. And there's a lot to be said here. Um, I think in the context of historical project, especially there's work to be done um, when it comes to attending to the ways that people in different time periods thought about the categories of mentality and capacity. That's part of the reason why I haven't dealt with consciousness very much yet in this project. Um, and unfortunately I can't go into too much detail here um, but for now, I just want to point out that in the context of 17th century philosophy, perception didn't only mean sense perception, it had a much sort of broader connotation. It could mean something like thought or awareness in general. Furthermore, Conway, not quite as consistent, consistently as perception, but she also often talks about knowledge, um, reason, other sort of key words like that when she's talking about the universality of life in creation. Okay, so we can still take perception though, since it's the most common one, as sort of a paradigm case of mental capacity. Um, again, there's more to be said, but I'm just gonna leave it here for the time being. So if this is right, then it seems we've already established that part of panpsych, or we've already established part of the definition I laid out earlier, the part that says mental capacities are ubiquitous in nature. So that was what I was getting at when I said we can now see down the path of, um, attributing panpsychism to her. We might worry that even if vitality and perception are sometimes linked for Conway, they are not always linked. Um, I think that this objection is untenable because of Conway's views on God and emanative causation, which we can discuss later if anyone is so inclined, but there are also other positive reasons such as her belief in universal salvation and the mechanisms associated with that um, for why every creature 
needs to have mental capacities um, at all times of its sort of existence um, on the ontological scale. Okay, so I take it to be pretty clear that it's at least reasonable to read Conway as endorsing the ubiquity of mental capacities in nature. But what's maybe more complicated is the question of fundamentality. And this point is important um, basically because if we, make, if we don't make mental capacities fundamental, then we run into other mind-body problems down the line, problems of emergence, problems of, you know, at what point, at what stage does mentality just sort of emerge out of whatever substance creation or nature is composed of? So at least for the purposes of reading Conway as someone who has a kind of solution to several mind-body problems, we want to see whether this fundamentality point can hold. And there are interpretive difficulties when it comes to identifying the fundamental building blocks of nature and Conway's ontology. This question of fundamentality and the role played by substance is related to the discussion of monism to which I'll soon turn. So for now, I just wanna say that Conway is not always clear about what counts as a substance in her, in her philosophy and furthermore, which substances are fundamental. In some places, she suggests that there are infinitely many substantially individuated creatures in nature and that these creatures are the proper building blocks of the individuals we recognize in everyday life. Um, in chapter three, section five, she says, quote, every creature has in itself such an infinity of parts or rather of entire creatures that they cannot be counted. Elsewhere, she indicates that there are only three substances in creation and what we view as diverse nature is really numerically one substance. In this instance, the panpsychism argument would need to show that nature itself possesses mental capacities. But for now, I wanna set these questions aside because I think that either way, whether we consider creatures or the single substance of nature to be metaphysically primary, mental capacities turn out to be present in both cases. So in the first case, um, the case of uh, existence pluralism, Conway is clear that, quote, there is no creature which does not receive something of God's goodness, close quote. So if, I've, if as I've been arguing, that living goodness always includes mental capacities, then the requirements for attributing panpsychism to Conway are fulfilled um, along this line. Turning to the substance of nature, we get similar results. The latter half of Conway's principles is devoted to defending an anti-dualist program according to which matter and spirit are two names for the same created substance in different states of grossness or density. Simplifying considerably, most standard dualisms assert that nature is made up of two kinds of substance, body or matter, which is essentially extended and inert, and mind or spirit, which is essentially unextended and active. Conway rejects this framework from multiple directions arguing that the single type of created substance is always extended as well as active, perceptive, and alive. In one representative passage, she writes, quote, nor is there any difference between body and spirit if body is taken not in their sense, who maintain that it is merely a dead thing lacking life, but in a proper sense, as an excellent creature of God, having life and sensation, which belong to it, either actually or potentially, except that body is the grosser part and spirit the more subtle. So even if creation as a whole is the basic creature of God, to say nothing of Christ, uh, life is ubiquitous and fundamental to it. So if I'm right that vitality implies perception or mental capacities, then mental capacities are fundamental in nature, regardless of whether we take individual creatures or creation itself to fulfill that like metaphysical priority. Okay, so this last point about Conway on body and spirit is already getting into a discussion of her monism. But before turning to that in earnest, I want to summarize some of my main claims so far. Okay, number one, panpsychism understood here is the view that mental capacities are fundamental to and ubiquitous in nature. Because of her views about the relation between God and creation, Conway thinks that life and perception are everywhere in nature. They are ubiquitous. This satisfies part one of the definition. And whether we take individuals or the substance of creation to be metaphysically prior or fundamental, life and perception are fundamental in Conway's view. This satisfies the second part of the definition. Point four just says she satisfies both parts of the definition. Okay, that's part one of the presentation. And now I'm gonna pivot to talking about 
panpsychism combined with Conway's form of monism. And we might wonder why we're talking about panpsychism. So what is the point of calling Conway a panpsychist if by doing this, we're really just looking at her vitalism from a different perspective? She doesn't spend all that much space, at least in the text that we have, talking about mind. Um, maybe she's not that concerned with it. But I think that it's important to name the panpsychism that I think is latent in her philosophy just for exegetical purposes or just to help understand the nuances and implications of her view. But as I've been suggesting, I also think that it's helpful to notice her panpsychism because doing so points to one of the major advantages of her position compared to other prominent views that were floating around in 17th century philosophy. Um, Mind-body problems can be counted among some of the more vexing issues that early modern philosophers dealt with. And in fact, in different ways, they continue to crop up um, in the philosophy of mind today, but in different forms. So it seems like it's worth looking at how her uh, system deals with this problem. Um, and at face value, panpsychism seems to help with several pressing my body problems. I talked about the interaction problem, famously encountered by Descartes, which seems to go away if everything in nature has mental capacities. I talked about emergence. Worries about emergence seem to dissolve if the stuff out of which minds are made already has mental capacities built in. And this is especially important to think about for panpsychism because it's a view that's widely considered super unintuitive, just plain weird. We need a really good reason to endorse this view. One of the really good reasons you might think is the way that panpsychism addresses mind-body problems. Unfortunately for fans of panpsychism, I don't think it's immediately clear that panpsychism really does solve these problems, at least without additional provisions about fundamental ontology. But fortunately for readers of Conway and fans of her, of which I am one, I suggest that she provides one example of how to combine panpsychism with ontological theses that together address several mind-body difficulties. Panpsychism doesn't alone dictate the details of a systems ontology. In a sense, it can advance a claim about mental activity while staying silent on other questions about what there is, how it's structured, and out of what it's composed. We might even be able to imagine a panpsychist system in which every material individual in nature has mental capacities, but does so in virtue of possessing an immaterial soul. So we can try to conceive of a panpsychist system that still adheres to substance dualism. And it's clear that such a picture would immediately reintroduce core issues in the mind-body debate. You know, how do the dualistic portions of the creature interact? How does the immaterial mind move the immaterial body? Other way around, how does the immaterial mind move the material body? Um, and Conway herself notes that if material substances always came with minds or souls, we would have a question, why are we distinguishing between them? Isn't there, doesn't that suggest that there might be a deeper connection than we've noticed? I'm not going to read out this quote, um, but here she seems to be suggesting this. Okay. So most forms of panpsychism probably are not dualistic in this way, um, in part the difficulties that that brings when it comes to thinking about fundamentality. But some monistic panpsychisms raise issues as well. We can think about sort of Barclay and idealism as it's sort of classically understood according to which minds are fundamental and bodies are practically illusions. So a problem there is why would God allow us to think we have bodies at all? From a different sort of Hobbesian angle, we could ask how is matter actually supposed to think or to put it in more contemporary terms, how do we account for the apparent gap between physicalist descriptions of the brain and the complexity of felt experience? And to take a more complicated example, how does body emerge from mind in Leibnizian idealism? which seeks to balance the view that immaterial minds make up the true foundation of nature with the reality of extended stuff. <clears throat> Any of these ways of organizing the substance of reality could be turned into a panpsychist view. Just making an ontology panpsychist might help with some mind-body problems, but it doesn't fix issues that are sort of built in to the system's ontological commitments. So what I'm saying is that panpsychism only qualifies as a robust solution to the mind-body problem if it's paired with the right kind of ontology. What is this right kind of ontology? Anti-dualism certainly seems to be a start. Um, and that goes beyond substance dualism. 
because while the forms of monism I just mentioned are not substance dualisms, they retain an element of dualistic thinking in that they choose either mind or matter as fundamental. And what's interesting about Conway's view is that she redefines matter and spirit such that they are one and the same. Now, when I talk about Conway's monism, I'm talking about her views on nature or the created universe. Many scholars have rightly pointed out, and unfortunately I've had to totally gloss over this in the interest of time, she endorses the existence of three degrees of substance, God, Christ, and creation. So minimally, we have to recognize her as a trialist. Um, at the same time, people like Jessica Gordon-Roth, Emily Thomas, and John Gray, among others, have found it profitable to ask what kind of monism she espouses when restricted to her views about creation, as I've been doing. Here, the issue often has to do with the status of individuals in creation. Is Conway a substance monist and an existence pluralist, or is she an existence monist who thinks individuals are modes of the single substance that is nature? Or as Thomas argues, is she a priority monist who thinks individual creatures are real entities that are nevertheless metaphysically dependent on nature as the sole basic natural substance? Though I'm inclined to agree with Thomas that priority monism provides a useful lens through which to read Conway, what is important for this paper is the fact that for Conway, nature is made out of one kind of substance that unifies mind and matter. And by that, I mean, it unifies thought and extension. Um, it may be tempting to read Conway as a spiritual monist, perhaps an idealist. And I think that the label vitalism sometimes takes on this connotation. So the quote on this slide, is an example of a place where she seems to be saying, body is this, is something that really almost emerges from spirit. So she says, quote, truly everybody is a spirit and nothing else. And it differs from a spirit only insofar as it is darker. Therefore the crasser it becomes, the more it is removed from the condition of spirit. So this comes in chapter six of the principles. Chapter seven is the place where Conway begins her all out assault on dualism. This is the place where she really argues that mind and body as we encounter them or matter and spirit, she seems to use the terms interchangeably, um, are one and the same substance. So I have this big but here because we can see later on in the text, she seems to put them on more equal ontological footing. So here she says, Spirit and body are of one original nature and substance, and body is nothing but fixed and condensed spirit, and spirit nothing but volatile body or body made subtle. Here, we don't see this connotation that body emerges from spirit. Instead, she's really straightforward about both of them being convertible into one another um, at all times. They can be understood in terms of one another. The second quote says, if one asks, how can the human soul, even in the highest state of purity, be united with God, since God is pure spirit, whereas the soul, though pure in the highest degree, always partakes of corporeality? It would be very interesting to be able to talk about Christ, but again, in the interest of time, we have to skip that. So here, I'm interested in this quote because she says that even in its most pure form, the human soul will always partake of corporeality. So this is textual evidence that for Conway, who seems to think that out of the sort of degrees of uh, creation, humans are at the top, even the most sort of noble part of creation is corporeal. And in fact, if we look at the conclusion of the principles, we see that Conway makes this unification of matter or corporeality or extension and spirit foundational to her philosophy. She says, quote, from what has just been said, and for various reasons offered that spirit and body were originally one and the same in the first substance, it plainly appears that the so-called philosophers who have taught otherwise, both ancient and modern, have generally erred and laid a poor foundation from the beginning. And thus their entire house and building is so weak and indeed so useless that the whole edifice must collapse in time. And crucially, you know, she's not arguing that everything that appears to be a body is really deep down a spirit in the usual sense. Instead, she argues that what we take to be different substances, matter and spirit, are in fact aspects of creation manifesting, quote, different but not opposing attributes of one thing, close quote. That's from the notes to chapter nine. 
she acknowledges that created spirit always partakes of corporeality and that matter is perceptive and alive. So whether she's an existence monist, priority monist, or whatever, not to dismiss those questions because I think they're very important, I think we can understand her as a substance monist in at least one crucial sense. So she views nature as being, as, as consisting in a single kind of substance that is always both extended and perceptive. And she requires that her theory, or she recognizes that her theory requires us to revise the common categories of matter and spirit. So in chapter nine, again, she writes, quote, when someone objects that according to this philosophy, every creature is material and corporeal, indeed is matter and body itself as Hobbes teaches, I reply that by material and corporeal, I mean something very different from Hobbes. And this did not occur to Hobbes or Descartes except in a dream. And we can return to the passage we saw earlier where she writes that the most excellent attributes of matter are spirit or life and light. As I argued earlier, this component of Conway's view should be read as panpsychism. Um, and in combination with the form of monism she espouses, I think she gets to avoid some of the problems that I mentioned in a very sort of superficial way earlier. Okay. So building on some of the claims that I've just made, I wanna just close by listing some of the, of the main conclusions that I've, been work, that I've been working towards. So first, panpsychism does not really solve mind-body problems unless further ontological specifications are made. Dualism immediately brings a lot of problems to the table and some forms of monism, especially those that seem to accept uh, dualistic conceptions of spirit and matter run into problems too. And Conway articulates a form of monism about nature that attributes both thought, as she says in chapter nine, life and extension, she talks about it in terms of shape to the single kind of substance out of which nature is made. We can set valid worries about her status as either an existence monist or pluralist to one side for now. So reading Conway in this way highlights what we could interpret as some of the advantages of her view vis-a-vis -vis the views of some of her contemporaries. And it also, I hope, or think, shows how reading thinkers like Conway could be useful to 21st century theories of mind and fundamental ontology. Thank you. Thank you, Olivia. All right, so uh, let's take questions now. We already have a few questions in the chat. If you have further questions, please raise your hand, or if you have a follow-up, say finger in the chat. Um, Bill, do you want to go first with your observation about space? Uh, yeah, I, I guess it wasn't really a, a question so much as just, an, I think, an interesting observation that, uh, and, and mainly for um, Sophia Calventi, um, just the, the, this idea of space as a place where bodies and spirit can't be ruled out per se, because it seems like something could consistently have a spatial location without being extended if it was a spatial point. And I think uh, some philosophers like uh, uh, Antoine Wilhelm Amo and uh, the 20th century philosopher Roderick Chisholm have something like that in mind. So I just thought that, that was a very interesting uh, theory of uh, space. And just thank, thank you for three excellent presentations. Yeah, thank you very much, Bill. Um, yes, Trotter does not consider a, um, the, uh, the example of uh, mathematical points, for instance, but, but I think it could be a, a, a another good example of something extended, but not uh, being in a place. <laughs> yes, of course. Thank you very much. Thank you both. Uh, Marlene Rosemond for uh, Sophia first. Hi, uh, thank you. Those, those were talks were all super fascinating. Um, so I have tons of questions because I think about this stuff all the time. Um, but I typed in the question for Sophia. Um, so um, so you, you talked about um, Okay, yes, <laughs> I'm getting confused between my questions um, about arguments against thinking matter in Cudworth. And I thought that the um, arguments about emergence wouldn't address Locke because Locke doesn't talk about thinking emerging from matter, but God, you know, super adding thinking to matter. So I, I thought that those emergence arguments don't, don't really address Locke. 
Does that seem right? Yeah, well, um, I, I'm not sure uh, about, maybe Natalia can tell us about the, um, if, uh, about the relation between Cadworth and, and Locke uh, concerning if they, they read each other or not. But you're right in the sense that uh, Locke is, is uh, with his suggestion, he's not uh, saying that matter can by itself produce a uh, thought. So in that way, it is not like a, like a threat to the uh, scale of beings. But I was discussing that this point a lot with Natalia <laughs> because I, I, I was trying to wonder if Cadworth would admit something like that suggestion or something like if God, I don't know, just uh, wants to do <laughs> that, why not? But then, uh, well, perhaps Natalia can, may, uh, is, is able to answer better than me about Cadworth, but uh, what, what we were talking about is, is that maybe even um, to do that uh, sort of miracle uh, won't be suitable for, for Cadworth's universe. I don't know. I, I was thinking about that a lot, about your, your question, Marlene, if, if uh, even uh, Cadworth would admit the, the bare possibility <laughs> of, of that uh, super adding thought to, to matter as an extraordinary event, not as a, a result or as a effect of matter itself. Maybe, I don't know, uh, Natalia, if you want to say something about Cadworth. <laughs> Well, well, the 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 thing is that the, how uh, is Cadworth God? He is in, is intelligent, and this is an intelligent plan. So he fo this God follows these laws that uh, in parts in in the universe. So it cannot be like uh, God wants to put uh, uh, thought in matter and as a miracle and that that is not possible in this in this framework that's the the the, the difference uh, between i think what uh, you are talking about Locke. no dog says well maybe god can put well for cadward that is impossible because yeah. this god follows uh, mm -hmm. this this intelligent uh, laws Mm. Yeah, or maybe like Leibniz, Cutworth would say, well, God could do it, but he just wouldn't. Yes. <laughs> because yes. he wouldn't go with his plans. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, yeah. It, it is not a limit for him. Right. But he yeah. would do it. Yeah. So, but it reminded me also, oh, so I hadn't looked at all this stuff about hierarchies in Cutworth, which is so interesting, but it reminded me of um, scholastic arguments. So, um, in Suarez, as I recall, there's an argument for the existence of rational human souls that are forms of bodies from the hierarchy of being because the rational soul fits exactly, a, a rational soul joined to a body fits exactly a gap between all the purely immaterial entities and the material ones. Um, and so the idea, uh, I, I mean, I hadn't thought about Cutworth in his hierarchy, that, that for Cutworth, that wouldn't go at all, I thought was really striking. Okay, thank you, all three of you. Uh, Vila Paukinen for Olivia. Thanks. Uh, just a clarificatory question about um, Conway's concept of perception. You, you want to say that she's a panpsychist, but panpsychism doesn't mean that consciousness is or has to be ubiquitous in the universe. And instead, you suggested that perception is the paradigm case of mentality that is ubiquitous in the universe. So I you said something about it. Could you just elaborate a bit more? What is perception for Conway? And uh, moreover, uh, what, I take it that perception doesn't involve consciousness. But um, I wonder if you could elaborate a bit. What is non-conscious percept? What non-conscious perception could amount to? Yeah, thanks for this question. Um, I think that this is definitely something that needs to be clarified and I'm still thinking about it. I do just, I didn't mean to say that I don't think perception is conscious. What I was trying to say was, I'm not yet arguing that consciousness is what's at stake when we're talking about panpsychism. And part of the reason for that is just that I'm not fully confident. I need to think about it more and look at the text more 
um, and think more about sort of like what, um, partly because I'm interested in connecting this work to some more um, contemporary work that's happening. I don't want to just rush ahead in saying that it's the same kind of consciousness that's at stake in both places. So that was more what I was trying to suggest. I wasn't trying to rule out consciousness um, from Conway, from Conway's panpsychism. Um, and then, yeah, thanks for pointing out the, there was another kind of like infelicitous thing. So I, I shouldn't have said it's the paradigm. What I was trying to say was we, when we see that term popping up in the text, we can take that as an indication that she's attributing mental capacity to creation. So I don't mean that perception is somehow the category that all other mental capacities reduce to, or that it's like the primary example that we should always be tracking but rather that even if we don't have one of those lists where she says life or perception or knowledge, perception alone is enough to um, indicate that mental capacities are being talked about. So I hope that helps clarify um, your question as to like, what does Conway think perception is? I'm afraid I can't give you that great of an answer right now, other than, um, you know, I, I, I do think that my intuition is that there is something a little bit more conscious happening here but I mean one option would be to think about it in almost Leibnizian terms where there's not some necessarily something reflective happening at the level of perception even if by itself um yeah again like perception is not somehow sort of barred from eventually ascending to the level of something more reflective um something else I didn't get to talk about in the presentation but which I think is also relevant here is her theory of intertransmutation of individuals. So I don't know, I don't know um, if this is familiar to you or not, but Conway thinks that like after death, basically our um, God meets out justice by transmuting us into a kind of thing that best reflects our moral comportment in our lives. So the classic example of this is that like over many successive lifetimes, a stone could become a human being and it would still be the same individual in some sense. It seems that there needs at least to be the seed of full-blown rational reflective consciousness if we look at it from that perspective. Um, but again, I'm not, I'm just not trying to make too many strong claims about that right now because I'm still working out how to do it. Um, in a good way. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Um, Aaron Wolf. I hear you, but I'm not sure why. I think there is a problem with the microphone. You appear unmuted, but... Um, Despite that, we can't hear you. How about um, how about we take Sylvia first and then you try to fix the microphone issue? Thank you. So uh, thank you very much for the three very interesting and excellent talks. And I have a question for Natalia. So our two questions. Um, one has to do with this um, uh, view of magic in Cadworth. I was wondering if you find a kind of uh, definition or description of what uh, magic means by him, um, because I, I thought that it could have um, a different sense if I don't, uh, if I understand well, um, um, what you say is that he uh, make a kind of contrast between uh, magic and mechanicism or something like this. Um, but when uh, you uh, describe the action of plastic nature, plastic nature as magical or uh, magically done or so, I thought that it would have uh, the sense of uh, the practical side of magic as the, um, uh, so to say, practical knowledge that was one of the senses of magic in the 17th century as the application, so to say, of the highest uh, natural knowledge in practice. So that is uh, one question. And the other question has to do with the notion of uh, common nature, uh, which was related to the moral aspect of his uh, 
philosophy. I was wondering if uh, he also claims that this common nature um, um, uh, lies in uh, no human beings. I mean, so everything in nature has this common nature and has its own tendency, its own tendency to self-preservation, for instance. Well, thank you very much for, for the questions. Um, concerning magic, uh, well, I think it has two dimensions. One, to uh, distinguish this from mechanical movement. But the other, the other dimension is to, uh, um, yes, to think about this as a different kind of acting like a human one. So it's God action and i think it can be related with what you said because it's practice um, uh, plastic nature uh, only acts and doesn't understand what it is doing so it's only this knowledge of the practical of, of how to do and i think uh, this plus this this is not uh, human acting and this is not mechanical movement this concerning uh, magic and um, well this common nature i think it um, it belongs to the potation that that i present was only for for human uh, beings but i think it can be extended to all the universe because it is um, in material substance that has this difference uh, um, forms or, 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 or ways of appear such as souls or plastic nature, but plastic nature is everywhere, even in souls. So I think um, in material substance has some unity that unifies all the, the, the creative universe. And I think that can be, can be, uh, can apply to all. So Thank you very much for, for your questions. May I add another question? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. For Sofia. Yeah. And I I like to know more about um, the context in which uh, Catherine Trotter discussed uh, the notion of space because I I, uh, I wonder why she got interested in this uh, problem uh, because as you told uh, she. Um, her, her main interests were on the moral uh, philosophy and then uh, why uh, space was uh, uh, an important question to discuss for her. Well, the, this, uh, thank you, Sylvia, for the question. Um, the discussion uh, about space is uh, in that uh, short um, text, uh, which is uh, like... Um, prelude to, to uh, remarks upon some writers where she deals with, with uh, moral questions. But uh, she was discussing a, um, Edmund Law and uh, Isaac Watts' uh, positions um, concerning the, uh, if, uh, the nature of space, if it was a, um, the, one of them argued a, for a nihilist position and the other for an idealist position. And she was very interested in, in saying that space is uh, something and not an, a general idea or, uh, or a vac vacuum. Uh, but then, then she, she discusses with them and then she talks about if space is infinite or not. And then she jumps into <laughs> uh, moral questions. Uh, which are mainly uh, defending the position of um, Samuel Clark. <laughs> so uh, some people uh, says that um, the whole of her philosophy is inconsistent be because she's defending Locke and Clark at the same time. But I don't think that is that is necessarily so. <laughs> uh, she finds some common points uh, between them. But yes, it's a sort of uh, discussion that um, she prefixed and wrote afterwards so she decided to to put it there before she wrote the um, the remarks but i i don't see any special connection between both between remarks and cursory thoughts 
Yeah. I'm oh, sorry to interrupt, but does she say anything about Clark's idea of the sensorium? No, no, uh, she doesn't mention uh, um, Clark in, in that short piece. Uh, but I know that, that Clark uh, defended something like an extended uh, um, soul. Uh, and she only mentions Clark when she says, I, I don't think space is the place for ideas, but the place for souls uh, and uh, for, uh, for bodies. It's like Sometimes she, it's almost like uh, for Clark, uh, space is a sensory organ of God or something. It's really, really bizarre. Yes. Also, uh, yes, 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 of course. Uh, she only mentions him uh, just uh, passing. <laughs> but uh, then in the remarks, he, he, she defends uh, his moral position, but, but she's not talking about, she, she doesn't return to the uh, discussions about space in the rest <laughs> of the text. So yes, probably there, there's a bit uh, more to need uh, to, to be researched concerning that, maybe in, in her correspondence or why, uh, concerning why she was so worried about that topic. Uh, and, and then she, she doesn't go to, to that uh, topic again. She, she doesn't come back to, she doesn't revisit it again. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay, thank you. Um, Aaron, do you want to try your microphone again? Uh, same problem. <laughs> okay, so how about you type the question and I'll read it out in, in the... Wait, did you already do that? Oh yeah, you do. Okay, so I'll just read out your question. Um, so Aaron was wondering if Conry's views map onto contemporary property dualism in the philosophy of mind, if not substance dualism, that is, it seems like life and shape properties are irreducibly different kinds of property. Olivia. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah, thanks for this. Um, I have been thinking about this a little bit recently and I think that it's a very good sort of suggestion. Um, I'm open to going down that line, but I'm just not sure. I think um, I, there's just more that I want to do to make sure that I completely understand both uh, the different views that are sort of raised in the vicinity of contemporary property dualism and then also Conway's view before making that kind of claim. But that aside, basically, I do think that that's a good suggestion. Um, I've also thought about it in terms of um, neutral monism but I think that you're right that it's a little bit harder uh, to really reconcile um, thought and extension for her into something neutral. But then the question becomes like, are they things that emerge from an underlying sort of deeper neutral substance or are they, or is the substance that is exhibiting um, or, or are they supposed to be, sorry, sort of like reducible into something neutral, like, or resolvable into something neutral, like I was just saying. And I think that there are passages that could go either way in the Conway. Um, but I do think that that's a good way to think about it. Um, I just don't want to commit to saying, yes, that's what I would say. Um, all right, well, Natalia also has a question for Olivia. Well, thank you very much. Uh, um, I want to ask you, uh, well, I, I can I don't understand how this perception can be fine in the, the stone. I think that there was another question concerning this. And I, I'm, I'm thinking, you represent two texts where uh, it says that this substance has life and the capacity of knowledge and perception. No, no that all has knowledge and perception. And in another text, it, it says, it has perception or knowledge, actually or potentially. So I think you, we have to take uh, uh, in mind the idea of transmutation. The stone has the capacity of perception when it transmutes to something that can perceive. And in chapter nine, she is explicit about that. She says that you need figure to activate those capacities. In chapter nine, number eight, she says that figure is, um, yes, it needs, it needs to be present to um, uh, perceive or, or act, I think 
she is saying she's uh, um, uh, that you need these forms or, or figures to can perceive. So these capacities and this potentially, uh, it has to do something in this in this in this frame. And I think transmutation is is the, the answer to this. The 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 stone does not. Uh, uh, perceive and, and does not know, but eventually it can transmutate and perceive and know. Uh, what do you think about this? This is my reading of, of Anne Conway. Yeah, thanks for bringing this up. Um, I think you are totally right to point out those passages and to point to transmutation as some the thing that sort of makes the that actualizes the potential or that brings about the state of affairs such that the potential can be actualized. Um, but I think that this is consistent with the view that I was trying to describe when I was describing panpsychism. Um, and this, I think, is also sort of what um, we can see in the in the Seeger quote that I that I pulled my definition of panpsychism from, where he says, this doesn't mean that everything is conscious. So the, so the fundamentality and ubiquity of mental capacities, which is my working definition for panpsychism in Conway, doesn't yet say that every sort of configuration of created stuff is maximally rational or ma even maximally perceptive. It just means that whenever the right configuration of matters and spirits um, obtains, and it does have rational or, or uh, reflective perception or perhaps consciousness or whatever, that didn't just come out of nowhere. That didn't just like suddenly emerge from something that prior to that was completely inert and could only be described in terms of extension. Um, at the same time, so, so I think that there's one way of reading this that is actually consistent with what you're suggesting. And that might be in some way, I, I'm, I think that's probably in some ways the way to go. I also think though that there are places in the text where she seems to be suggesting something a little bit more radical when it comes to sensitivity um, and sympathy being present in all creatures. I think that there's a link between sympathy and sensitivity and perception. And I think that she would say that a stone is in a kind of sympathetic union, or you know, the creatures that compose the stone are in a kind of sympathetic union, both with each other, that's why they're configured as the stone at that time, but also with every other creature in nature. Um, and I don't think that, or I think it's hard to make sense of that without attributing some kind of, maybe perception is the wrong word, but um, mental or sensitive capacity maybe to, all creatures, even the ones that seem sort of the most gross and inanimate. Um, but I think that there is a difficulty there because there are a number of passages that seem to adhere to this other, much more sort of straightforward view where maybe mental capacities exist by virtue of the substantial unity of spirit and matter, uh, maybe they exist everywhere in creation, but that doesn't mean that every individual in nature is perceptive. And she does have this kind of emergentist story. Um, but, but, but at the same time, I think that there are other parts of her theory that are amenable to a more radical view, like I said. So, so it's a little bit difficult to reconcile, um, but I hope that that, that um, responds to your question in a satisfactory way. It's a very good question. I think it's a real difficulty. Um, for interpreting her in this way. Yes, well, I agree with you that there is some sympathy and, and this union between everything, this love that, that runs through all the, the creation. And I think this is, this is real. And something that I do maybe is affecting uh, the, the stone. But I don't know if it's the other way down. Uh, that's my, my, my doubt. And, and I don't know if it depends of the life of the stone 
that she that this stone will uh, transcend uh, uh, transmutate in in another higher level or lower level i think this connection is what uh, um, determines where the stone goes after death what is death for the stone we don't know but well thank you very much uh, I, I will keep thinking about this and i want to breathe you in in a time thank uh dan you. uh dan wants to jump in here um yeah this is a very interesting conversation about perception but i think that there are many people before Conway and after Conway who thought that uh, perception was widely distributed and not in a way that's conscious. Um, for example, Francis Bacon thought that everything was uh, perceptive, that you need that to explain things, for example, like magnetism um, and all sorts of other, all sorts of other phenomena. So I think I think that um, Conway, in a certain way, is and this is not an entire. Like, she has many original positions, but I think that this is one that actually links her with a lot of figures going back at least to the sort of mid late sixteenth century, and on after her to, uh, to, to to Leibniz and beyond. I I'm not sure that it's really that mysterious and. It may be that given that it was a uh, position that was in some ways widely held, she may not have felt that she needed to go into great detail because it's something that, you know, any philosophical reader in, you know, a very wide circle would have, may not have agreed with, but certainly would have understood, you know, what the position was. Um, yeah, I, that's a really good point. I think that's right. And um, in the paper that this talk is a, is a version of at the end, I, I talk a bit about how just because this maybe makes Conway seem sort of distinctive from the canonical perspective that we have now, that doesn't mean that she was actually getting this out of nowhere. Um, and she's not alone. It, it, may be a limita it may be a limitation in what it is that we consider canonical. Yeah, I actually think that that's a, a plausible explanation for reading, for seeing her as being sort of totally distinctive in this way, when in fact she's responding to a, a tradition and has peers yeah. who are saying similar things. Um, my Margaret dissertation Cavendish, project, for example, held exactly. a position. Yeah, and my dissertation project also talks about Margaret Cavendish. So I'm really interested in the ways that their views are similar and the ways that their views are different. Um, yeah, I just th I think that that's right. And I, I have more things to say about the unity of God's attributes and the way that they're emanated and that being something that makes it more than just perception that every that um, creation as a whole sort of inherits from God. But I know that we're kind of getting to the end of our time. And I think there's more questions. So I don't want to um, go on too long. I'll just say that I think that's something that I mentioned in the talk very briefly. I didn't get to explain too much, but um, I think that because of the structure of emanation for her, it's not the case that like just perception could be uh, present in all of nature, all of creation. Of course, it comes down to how are you carving up nature creation and what's fundamental, um, which is a, a difficulty with interpreting her. But I think that there's definitely room to interpret her as making a much stronger claim, which is that all of God's act positive, or sorry, all of God's communicable attributes are emanated as a kind of package deal and that perception comes along with goodness, it comes along with love, it comes along with knowledge. Um, and I think that that's something that's maybe a little bit more robust, um, yeah. even if it doesn't make her unique, it is a bit different from what some other people were yeah. saying. So yeah, but I do think that that's a really good consideration. Just very quickly, did might she have read Cavendish? Um, it's interesting. So there's an exchange about Cavendish in the, her correspondence with Moore. It doesn't it's not clear from that that Conway read Cavendish. Moore is pretty dismissive of Cavendish in the correspondence. So she was certainly aware of Cavendish, but it's we can't say with certainty that she read her to my knowledge, but it's possible. Thank you. Uh, Marlene uh, Rosamond. 
Yeah, uh, so uh, one, one of my questions was already asked by, I think, Natalia about the uh, potential <laughs> stuff. And it's, it's, yeah, it bugs me, but uh, it's very interesting. So my question, so I, have, so I really liked your comments about it matters what kind of monism you have and so on and so forth. But I wondered whether um, for Conway, Pan, I wonder whether for Conway, panpsychism would be important to mind-body interaction. So that's one of the mind-body problems. Um, and I'm reminded of her comparison with the ship with sails. And if you have a sail, sails that are really net, then the wind would just go through it. Um, and she holds that against Moore's view that um, spirits are extended but penetrable. So for the interaction problem, I'm not sure that panpsychism helps, but that what she thinks is important is that everything is extended and impenetrable. Yeah, I see you nodding. <laughs> yeah, um, I think that I think that you're right, and I didn't get to make this point very clearly in the talk. But one thing that the paper talks about is this potentially sort of uh, counterintuitive result that even though everything is a spirit and nothing else, it's also all extended when we're talking about creation for her. Um, and I do think that that's one of the most important arguments for that and that the fact that for Conway, created spirits always have shape and extension. Um, that is the thing that really, that she addresses the interaction problem most directly through. That was a very convoluted sentence, but I hope that my meaning is clear. Um, I, I think that that's right. Um, the point that I was making about panpsychism is just that in general, when we're thinking about mind body problems, panpsychism might seem like a way to get rid of the sort of huge gulf between the kinds of substances that we're positing. But I think that you're right that for Conway specifically, um, it's really something a little bit different, which I also think is very interesting and important, which is that for her, all created, uh, all created spirits are extended. Yeah, and it's it's not just extension because more had a kind of extension without impenetrability. That's right, right. impenetrability. And I always liked really about really about uh, the Princess Elizabeth and Cavendish and Conway. They're very specific about what the interaction problem is. They didn't just say they're different. What's it's a problem? But it had specific views, and that's what really strengthens their objections. Also, yes, thank you, thank you both. Uh, and now the last question uh, from uh, Dennis. Uh, I want to ask if uh, to Olivia whether um, Conway has one one consistent view on the unity of uh, matter and uh, spirits. So I pulled out the quote from chapter uh, eight. I'll quickly read it out. Let it be noted here that in all hard bodies such as stones, etc., there exist many spirits which are as if imprisoned in gross bodies and united with them because they cannot flow out or flow away into other bodies until death or dissolution occurs. Now, the relation in question in this quotation is um, one of um, containments, uh, he says imprisonment, as if imprisonment. Uh, so containment of some sort, spatial containment, and it doesn't allow for free motion, I you know, think, uh, and uh, it isn't one of identity, so it's not saying that the material by stone is identical to this certain spirit, or it emerges out of those spirits, or it is grounded on those spirits, or something else. So it seems to be, at least in this quotation, one of spatial containment. Uh, so the unity in question there is uh, not much more than that. So, I mean, I wonder if this is something that, uh, uh, a panpsychist should or would say, uh, and uh, it, in other places, it, she seems to be saying something different about unity. But here's an example where it, she, it's one of uh, just containment. And uh, but, I mean, this arose in your answer earlier on to, to somebody else too, that she might have different views that seem in some way uh, similar, but they don't really fit together very well. And this might be an instance where things don't really fit. Yeah, excuse me, thank you. Um, 
a couple of thoughts, just this is a really, I think that this question and several other questions that people have brought up are really getting at, you know, one of the most sort of subtle tasks <laughs> that I have um, in trying to make these arguments. Um, so, I mean, I think this is just getting at something really important and I don't know if I'll be able to do it justice in the couple minutes that I have, but I'll try. So, um, One thing that's going on here, I think, is she's trying to explain how in the sort of physical world that we experience, her theory works. So we encounter hard bodies all the time. You know, we are in corporeal hard bodies, if you will. Um, so I think part of what's happening here is explaining, okay, I said earlier that creatures are infinitely divisible into creatures so much so that from the fine perspective of the finite intellect, they cannot be counted. Well, what does that actually look like? Um, there are gonna be some creatures that are, as it were, composing me that are gonna be more subtle and some that are more gross. Now, I think for her, it's really important to point out that although grossness is related to hardness, which we might think of as being related to extension or body in the kind of Cartesian or mechanistic sense, for her, she often talks about grossness as being a limitation of activity. So you're less, you're gross, you're congealed <laughs> because you're less spiritual, which means you're less active. That doesn't mean that you are not spiritual at all or that you are totally inert. Um, and I think that what's happening here, uh, if you look at, I, I looked at my text, like the rest of that, that passage, she's talking about how um, like physically when a rock wears down, maybe this is what death is for a rock, um, those grosser spirits are in a sense liberated. And then they're no longer as limited um, as they were when they were in the configuration that was the stone. Um, the more active spirits that were previously trapped in the stone um, are then able to sort of move on and be in a different configuration that's even more active and vital. Um, so I don't know if this is a satisfying response because I know you were asking about panpsychism and is this the kind of thing that a panpsychist would say? I think that I need to, there's more to be said to that. I mean, I think that what I've, I've, I've tried to sort of explain how I see grossness in this context as not being something that's opposed to activity, but is more of a limitation on activity. Um, then of course, though, there's still the need to link activity to ment mental capacity, which is what I tried to do much earlier in the talk. That would need further elaboration. And I know that doesn't directly answer your question, but I see it's three o'clock in New York now. So um, maybe I should stop it, but thank you. I mean, again, these are, these are really important issues to understand. Um, and of course, there's so much more to say. Okay, um, well, thank you everyone for an excellent panel and an excellent discussion uh, afterwards. Um, everyone is applauding, but you can only really hear me. Um, right, and then see you next week. We will have a panel on logic and uh, methodology.